Yo, what is cooling? What is going on? How are you doing today? We've got the NFC North today. The Chicago Bears, Green Bay Packers, Detroit Lions, and Minnesota Vikings. Who had the best draft? Well, let's go ahead and find out, man. What's next time on, uh, I don't know. No, we're not going to wait till next time. Let's do this thing right here, right now. Let's start out with the Chicago Bears. What did they do? How did they help improve Justin Fields? But I don't think they actually did enough. Did they do enough? I don't don't think so and there's a reason why I gave him a C plus for this draft and if you look at this draft in a whole which we really need to do in a vacuum because you say to yourself plus you have to count in free agency a little bit too I know this is just draft grades but you also throw in free agency maybe they're going to be able to pick up someone like Odell Beckham or maybe they can pick up someone you know Julio Jones however you know they might have some tricks up their sleeve to get one of these free agent receivers but for the time being I'm a little concerned I really am for this offense and still even on the offensive line They've got some good development pieces in this draft, and I like the fact that they Ryan Pools traded down and got more draft selections. It's always good to get a few more players in the building, especially when you're a young, developing, rebuilding team, right? You need those uh, players to come in there and compete. So I do like that. I think Ryan Pools did a great job getting more draft selections and, and taking more shots because it's important. And they found some steals, like they definitely did, like Dominique Robinson. I think he was an absolute monster pick. In the fifth round at 174, this was the pick of the draft for me in terms of value and steal. This is a guy from Miami, Ohio, is going to come out there, and he might even compete early on. As I don't think he'll be a starter, but I know Robert Quinn is someone that could be on the trade block, and this guy could get a lot of reps early in his career. He really impressed me. When I went to watch Bernard Raymond, and he was like flying off the edge, I'm like, who is this guy? And Dominique Robinson, I find out, number 11, he's crazy dude. He was just whooping people. He was typically going up against uh, Luke Godick over there on the uh, right side, but he was flying off the edge. He's got that bend that you look for from these passers, super explosive off the line. If he can continue his pass rush plan, because the dude can be a monster. Now, in the run game, sometimes he gets a little overset there and gets pushed off. Godick definitely beat him up in the run game, but he did take him out there in the pass rushing game quite a bit, and when he went up against Raymond as well, he did a pretty dang good job, but anyway, Robinson, I thought was their best pick overall in the draft in terms of value. I love the Brisker and Gordon pick, as I was saying. Like, those picks, to me, are really, really good. Those are going to be staple. I mean, think about Jaquan Brisker and Matt Eberflus in this defense. He is going to be um, Kari Willis on crack. Like, he's literally going to be that dude in that strong safety role. It's it's a great, it's going to be just a great fit. I think Brisker is going to be an absolute dream beast for them going forward. That I don't have a problem with. Kyler Gordon, another guy that I love, man. He's so fluid as an athlete, man. I know he didn't put, you know, the craziest time in the 40, and that's why he ended up probably falling into the top of the second round. But he is so, so explosive in and out of his breaks. Just needs to continue to mature and uh, overall develop his coverage recognition and all that jazz, which he will. Remember, he's still young to football, but he's got that physical toughness, too, as a tackler. You love that. Overall, I love those two picks. It just, I would have loved to see them go after David Bell in the third round and or, you know, again, a combination of getting Julio Jones, David Bell, and then having Darnell Mooney. I would have been like feeling good about that with Justin Fields, but I just don't feel like Vailis Jones is going to be a huge upgrade with what they have over Equinemia Sam Brown. And that's something I'm a little bit worried about going into this year. And, and Brian Pringle, too, I should mention, because he's probably going to be a starter. So I think Vailis Jones is definitely going to be competing there for that second, third receiving position. But at the end of the day, I am, I'm worried. I am worried. But as I was saying, Vailis Jones, if nothing else, is going to provide a great kick or a punt returner and just get him the ball in, in his hands because he's going to be really, really good after the catch. That was what he's so good at at Tennessee. It's like get him on some crossers or some things real quick, and he's going to make dudes miss because he's just so tough to tackle. Uh, Braxton Jones in the fifth round. I thought this was a really good pick, too. Solid value. Out of Southern Utah, this is the ultimate developmental tackle. He's got the length, got good speed, um, you know, all that. But he, he was a little upright. He's going to have to uh, kind of rework his technique. I wouldn't say he was a Tyler Smith level of upright and posture, but he's going to have to definitely work on that overall anchor getting stronger. That, those are things he's going to have. He's a developmental tackle. I don't think he sees the field early on in his career, but he can be a dude that you redshirt and you see down the line because he does have the tools to be a starter in the NFL. Um, we talked about Dominique Robinson. I love that pick. 
Zachary Thomas, I wasn't super high out of San Diego State, but he's a run blocker. He's gonna, you know, he's got good movement skills too, so he fits Luke Getzey's uh, offensive new scheme there. Um, he's gonna be nice there as a run blocker, a mauler, but gonna have to definitely work on his pass protection and overall resetting, uh, re-anchoring those sort of things in his strength. Uh, Tristan Ebner, I think he's just more of a special teamer. I don't necessarily love, you know, him as a runner per se. I like him as a receiving back, a combi- you know, combination receiving back, special teams player, and that's kind of maybe why they draft him. Could be like a Tariq Cohen-ish, uh, you know, not really that sort of player, but maybe that sort of replacement looking forward to the future. And then you get Doug Kramer in here on the offense line. I like this pickup a lot out of Illinois in the sixth round. And we talk about taking chances on the offensive line. They got JT Carter as well. Uh, Carter is one of those dudes that um, I look at on the offensive line. And when you saw him at the senior bowl out of Southern, this guy is he's got the length you look for and he's got some power he's got some nice core strength but he he's still very much a work in progress and pass protection a lot of times he was just out leveraged or he overset way too many times letting up that inside got beat so many times there on the inside I didn't really watch a ton of his film on tape but in terms of like the senior ball I watched him there and I just felt like that was something that's going to be a bit of an issue for him at the next level I know he played tackle to left tackle there but I think he's going to be someone um, that more likely moves over to guard. And if you want to make a comparison, Dakota Dozer might be an interesting one for him, who also was a tackle in college from Fulham, I think, something like that. I think he came from Fulham. So he ended up moving into guard. I think that's what JT Carter will end up doing as well. Uh, going back to Doug Kramer, as a he's a really smart center. I, I think he's... Uh, extremely got that football IQ you look for, and I think he can compete. He's a little bit undersized at like six foot two, two ninety five, two or three hundred range, some three hundred range somewhere around there. But good football IQ, good mover. I think he's going to be a guy who comes in there and can compete there with Lucas Patrick or Sam Mustafer, which Mustafer I think I might even play playing guard this year. We'll have to wait and see. At least that's what he did early on in voluntary involuntary training camp. But Dred Kramer, nice little addition, swing throw at it. And I'm not going to hate about JT Carter either in the seventh round adding some more offensive line and then you get Elijah Hicks who I think is just gonna be a special teamer kind of a versatile player but I think he's gonna be a special teamer for you and then Trenton Gill was someone I didn't really watch actually because I did go through a lot of punters I heard about Trenton Gill coming out of North Carolina State but I did not watch him so part of me on that but getting a punter in there to compete is never a bad idea I guess and there's some of your UDFA pickups Master T yay why not man Chase Allen I do love Jack Sanborn that was my favorite one Coney Durr also a guy that I think can come in there and compete in the slot early on in his career. Uh, Taking a look now onto the roster itself and some jobs that could be closely monitored in free agents or uh, OTAs. Uh, Starting out with the offensive line, which is going to be huge. And and this is my guess as the starting line for right now with Borum being your left tackle, Elton Jenkins over at right tackle, and then you bring in Braxton Jones as a backup. Same thing with Zachary Thomas. And Zachary Thomas might even move in a guard at the next level. But anyway, that's kind of my tackle group or your tackle group at the point. You still have, or you bring in Julian Davenport as another dude, Legere's Lechevious Simmons as a backup right tackle at the moment. Um, And, you know, again, it... It still wouldn't be an option where they could go after a veteran here. Maybe they can fail someone, get someone like Eric Fisher or something to come in there and start at left tackle, have Larry Borum as maybe just a swing. On to the interior offensive line. Keep an eye out on that right guard position. I think Whitehair and Patrick are kind of solidified at left guard and center, but right guard, you could have a lot of competition with uh, between Dozer or Mustafa or an impending free agent. I mean, Wright or Carter. I think those guys could all compete there, but that's kind of my, their offensive line right now is a little shaky, definitely still a bottom 20 offensive line. On to the receiving room, which I'm also worried about. Uh, oh man, it's it's concerning. It is concerning. Hopefully, hopefully Equinemius St. Brown can make the most of his opportunities, getting a chance as a potential starter. I mean, you do have Naz, Daz Newsom, Naz, Naz Newsom, uh, Daz Newsom, <laughs> Naz. Now I'm gonna have to call him Naz from now on. But uh, he's got Nanisha Webster. Um, you got some dudes here can compete. Isaiah Coulter, but uh, Br- uh, Brian Pringle gonna get his opportunity in the slot. Darnell Mooney is really the only solidified guy. Hopefully Cole Komet can be that dude in his third season or just for horse deck to maybe step up to. I know they had a nice connection in the end zone, but yeah, I'm worried, man. I'm worried for Justin Fields. I really am. This offensive line is concerning. The receiving weapons are concerning. I'm hoping. I'm hoping for the best. Going on to this defense, and you take a look at the secondary it's just a huge improvement. And that's one thing I'm really excited to see with this defense. Should be way better with Jaquan, or at least for the long haul. Jaquan Brisker, 
Eddie Jackson, what a great one-two punch. I mean, just absolutely a dream fits. Uh, Eddie Jackson going to be that free safety, and Brisker going to be that nice to box safety here uh, for Matt Eberflus. And you got some good depth, too, with DeAndre Houston Carson and Dan Kirkshank. And you added Elijah Hicks. I think, like I said, I'm going to be more of a special teamer early on depth piece for you. And then the cornerback room. I mean, we were worried about this as we were going into the draft, but adding in Kyler Gordon, which it just it makes too much sense. Now, he also going to be able to you know provide some inside-out versatility, just kind of the way I have it. But I think your rotation of four corners is going to be Kyler Gordon, Gordon, Jalen Johnson, Thomas Graham, and Taven Young. I think those are kind of your four corners, and I feel good about that. You added Duke Shelley and Kendall Vildor as a fifth, sixth corner, and yeah, that's a pretty solid secondary. A lot of youth there to uh, be competing. Uh, Linebacker-wise, you don't add a whole ton. You do add Jack Sanborn as a UDFA pickup. I was saying I love that one. Um, Joe Thomas, and we'll probably work in as that uh, third linebacker, maybe Noah Dawkins here and there, and same thing with Matthew Adams, but Overall, their two starters are going to be Nicholas Morrow and Roquan Smith, and I think Roquan may have a huge year in this defense. I think it's going to be a perfect, perfect scheme fit for him. And then the defensive line-wise, you add in Dominique Robinson with Robert Quinn, whether or not he's going to be still on the roster. All Quinn and Muhammad from Indianapolis already know when the system's going to be a great fit for them. And then Travis Gibson, who came on huge at the end of the season. You do have Cleo Max brother, but anyway, Travis Gibson, I do like him quite a bit. Sam Kamara has some more depth and whatnot. Jeremiah Tapp you, Charles Snowden. Um, yeah, their edge group's fine. I'm not too worried about it. They don't have a number one, but they're they're okay. Uh, interior defensive line, I am worried about this. Justin Jones, a pick up there, is going to be your three-tech. Mario Edwards as well can work in that role for the three-tech position, uh, which is such a, a vital position for Matt Eberflus. Angelo Blackson, Kyrus Tonga, kind of be your one-tech nose tackles in this defense. It's fine. I think they can get the job done, but it's not going to be great. I think this team's going to struggle on their defensive line throughout the year. Hopefully their coverage unit can hold up, though, because they're going to need it. This defensive line is going to be a little shaky for the time being, but hopefully down the line as they continue to invest in it, it'll be better. Uh, what I'm going to say for the Chicago Bears, did they do enough? Look, they didn't have many draft picks, so I'm not going to say Ryan Pools did a terrible job. I like what he did to get more draft picks, and he just said, you know what? We're going to improve the secondary because we need to do it, and they really did, so I don't, I'm not going to hate Ryan Pools. I just think that the offense is really concerning to me, and you want to make sure you're providing as much as you can for your young quarterback because you want to find out if he's the guy. You don't want to be end up in limbo for the next two, three years saying, well, is Justin Fields, is, it, is he just getting hammered all the time? Or, you know, what kind of situation is this? And that's where I'm a little concerned. But we'll see how things go. That's kind of my view on the Chicago Bears. On to the Lion King. The Detroit Lions. Brad Holmes, Dan Campbell. They crushed it again, in my opinion. Look at this draft. Oh, my goodness. Aiden Hutchinson. Edge rusher, Michigan Wolverine, staying home in Detroit. What a pick. I mean, just A+. plus. You can't go any other route, man. They fall. He falls to them at number two, and they select the hometown hero. Then you get Jamison Williams. We weren't done. They're like, you know what? Let's make a trade with Minnesota. And a good trade at that for both teams, but Detroit, they really got a, a great deal. Didn't have to give up a whole ton of value to get someone of extreme value, in my opinion. That Jamison Williams, yeah, he might be on the pup list for the first six weeks. Whatever. But I talked about this in the offseason. The reason why I had been mocking Malik Willis to this team so much was because I think they needed some explosive element to their offense, something that they were lacking. And even I was saying this earlier, I would love for them to trade down and get a receiver at the number one overall pick at the time, right? Or the second overall pick now that they had. Like, I was hoping they would get a receiver because they needed something. They needed an explosive element to this offense. And I'm cool letting Jared Goff ring the helms for another you know, year or however. If he keeps playing well and he can win with them, then I don't care. Do it because Jared Goff's not a bad quarterback, but they needed something to this offense and they get it with Jamison Williams. And even like I said, if it's not for the first six weeks or so, let him ease him in there. That's no big deal, but you're getting yourself an explosive offense. You now have DJ Chark. You have the wing dragon of raw in the slot and you have Jam Jamison Williams and speed threat. I mean, it's just a great offense. Qantas Cephas, Josh Reynolds, like you're not too bad now. Like you've got a group, Cleve Raymond. I like it. They're building something here in Detroit. Not to mention you had another receiving threat at tight end. Because remember, when Hawk was injured last year, they didn't really have a whole ton there after Hawkinson that threatened the defense. James Mitchell coming off that ACL injury as well. But 
he's more further along. I think he had his ACL in September. Don't quote me on that. Something like that. But he should be pretty far along. And I, I don't see why he shouldn't be ready even for training camp or at least the preseason. So getting another receiving threat in James Mitchell, who has that uh, you know all-around skill set, good body control, great hands, decent route runner. I think he's an upside tight end there in the fifth round, which was just a great selection too. But uh, going back to Jamison Williams, I absolutely love that. At first, I was a little worried. I'm like, uh-oh, what are they giving up? And then I saw the trade deal deals and I'm like wow this is a huge win for Detroit in my opinion it was a win for Minnesota too getting more draft capital so I think it was a win-win deal um, and then you get into Josh Pascal uh, defensive lineman out of Kentucky I was a big fan of him I really am I like him a lot I thought it was a little bit of a reach and that's why I give it a B minus but I don't ever have a problem going after some more defensive line talent and he's he might even play more as a five tech on this defensive line that would be my guess because he's so strong on the interior but he's going to bring some more competition in there with Levi owns a Enrique and just you know they can both play on the same time too but I think he's going to come in there and play on the interior as well on the edge in certain packages and rotations but Josh Pascal is a guy who's super strong in the run game uh, really strong at the point of attack got enough burst on the get you know with his get off to be able to attack and penetrate inside sounds a little weird but anyway Josh Pascal is a dude that I, I think is going to be nice there on that defensive rotation um, and then you go into Kirby Joseph and another thing also about Josh Pascal is he's a warrior man I mean talk about Dan Campbell kneecapping uh, just tough nose great per I mean just the coaches, Mark Stoops, just raved about this kid. I think he had like a melanoma or some sort of cancer treatment he had to go through in his skin. Unbelievable, man. Great story that he had to pursue and, and fight through, man. And he's just a warrior. He's a, he's a road warrior, great locker room dude from the, the sounds of it, and, and just an absolute monster coming into this group, which you know Detroit. They want those guys who are going to set the tone, and that's Josh Pascal and Aiden Hutchinson, and I think Jamison Williams is going to be great. Uh, and then you get Kirby Joseph here in the third round, which I thought was a great solid pick too. I mean, overall, he's going to provide another deep safety for them, and this is kind of what you could look at is Tracy Walker as a deep safety, and then when they want to put Deshaun Elliott like in, in the box maybe, you can have Kirby Joseph as that other deep safety. So in those big nickel packages, that could be your nice rotation because he's going to provide that in the back end. And he showed off some serious playmaking skills this past year at Illinois when he got his opportunity. Great sideline to sideline range. Going to add some more deep element into that secondary, which is not a problem at all. Going to have to continue to work on his tackling skills and things like that. But either way, I think he's going to be a nice addition in that back end with Tracy Walker. And then you get James Mitchell. We talked about him. Nice little uh, backup pass catching dude and come along behind TJ Hawkinson. Malcolm Rodriguez from Oklahoma State, a great value pick here in the sixth round on the smaller side, right? It's going to be a particular type of fit, right? It was going to take a certain team that would want him. And I, I actually, I think I mocked him in my uh, draft to this. Oh, I, I mock a lot of these guys. So, you know, I'm bound to get lucky here and there with, with one of these guys. But I thought he was a dude that would be a perfect fit in Detroit. Coming in here, super high IQ guy. Uh, his, his play instincts, they're not quite Nate Lamman level, but he's got really, really good reading reaction skills, overall football IQ, understanding a play before it happens a lot. Maybe, you know, continue working on coverage instincts. But at the end of the day, I think he's going to be an absolute monster as a nice rotation for them and you know maybe more of a uh, backup will sort of you know early on in his career but he could be the long-term answer with Derek Barnes would be the hopeful or the hope there in Detroit uh, definitely like that pickup to add in the f to the sixth round and then you get James Houston out of Jackson State I mean the two just dominated you know in college football in this past season for Jackson State and in the NFL PA Bowl he was he was unstoppable, man. So he's he's explosive off the edge. Now I don't think he's like super twitchy guy in space. I think he's gonna struggle a little bit with tackling and stuff like that. Again, I don't think he's super bendy, but he's explosive off the edge and gonna add some serious more pass rush in certain uh, packages and whatnot as an you know a uh, off the ball linebacker in that defense. And then you get Chase Lucas as another corner from Arizona State. He's um you know what I so he like he's a good athlete, really loose athlete. I think he's gonna compete there for a slot role and with AJ Parker, Jeffrey Okuda might even play in the slot this season, but I think he could compete in that sort of a role for them. I think he could play on the outside too, but uh, watch out for that. He's going to have to get better though in terms of penalties. He was penalized quite a bit, very grabby, and overall his technique is going to have to improve. But in the seventh round, I don't have a problem with it. Good athlete, very smooth mover, and you get another corner 
to bring in here for some competition. And then uh, UDFA-wise, Abini Eze, not a bad pickup there. Uh, Derek Dees, another tight end from San Diego State. Kevin Jarvis, Jarvis from Michigan State. Jermaine Waller, and then Josh Johnson. I, I like those. You know, to Josh Johnson out of Tulsa, he's got to work on his drops, but I think he's a guy that gets open. Even though he didn't have a great 40 time, I'm not worried about it. The dude finds ways to get open. Jermaine Waller wasn't super high on him out of Virginia Tech, but you can add another playmaker in there to compete as a UDFA. We'll see if he ends up making the roster. Overall, though, Brad Holmes, Dan Campbell, killing it, man. An A for me, almost an A+. Plus. Like, I, I, hey, if you want to come out with an A+, plus, I just think they, you know, could have been a couple other picks I would have gone after. But either way, an A for me. This is a top 10 draft. And overall, Detroit Lions, I love the way they're going. And you take a look at this roster, you add in some help and receiver in a major way. First off with DJ Chark in the offseason of free agency, and now you're not done. You add in Jamison Williams with Ahmad Ross St. Brown, TJ Hawkinson, James Mitchell is another pass-catching tight end. You still have Brock Wright who can compete there with Garrett Griffin as a blocking number two tight end. Wow, I mean, that is a receiving room. Plus, look at this offensive line. I mean, and Valtai is not terrible. He had a, had a pretty decent season last year. And Jonah Jackson, I mean, that's not bad. I mean, look, if that's your weakness on your offensive line, if you can just stay healthy this year, that's their big thing. You have Matt Nelson as a backup, a swing tackle, you know, or Dan Skipper. But uh, Taylor Decker, Panay if those guys can stay healthy, this offensive line, Frank Ragnow as well. But it's a great offensive line, potentially a top five level offensive line in the NFL, but I would say top 10 at least. And then you add in that great receiving room, at least like a ton of potential. Their running back room is really deep, really good. Jared Goff is going to have so many more weapons. And yeah, I'm, I, this offense could be legit this year. It really could. And then defensively, uh, not bad either. Some huge improvements with Aiden Hutchinson, Josh Pascal, like I talked about, giving you some versatility on the interior of that line and on the edge position because you got Charles Harris, uh, Julian Aquara still, and J uh, James Houston you add to the mix. So they're deep at the edge rushing position. I mean, they're very, very deep. Romeo Aquara coming back from injury. Big thing is, hopefully, uh, you know, some of these guys on the interior, like Ali McNeil and Levi Onzerike, can step up. Michael Brocker is going to need to have a better season as well. But that's going to be the big thing is, can their interior step up a little bit? Linebacking room is still some question marks, right? You bring in some veterans like, uh, you know, CJ Board. You now have uh, uh, Malcolm Rodriguez coming into the mix. You have Alex Anzalone coming back. Derek Barnes into year number two. Jared Davis, who's back. So, uh, Shane Dion Hamilton. So, you know, you're going to have some guys to figure out and, and, and all that, but that's going to be a question mark, something you keep an eye out on in OTAs, how that competition goes. Same thing with corner. Who's going to end up playing the slot? I, If I had to guess, I think Jeffrey Okuda may end up playing the slot. He might be the best person for the job. AJ Parker will definitely compete. I think Ch uh, Chase... Uh, Lucas could have an outside shot at, at getting some reps there with injuries, but for the most part, I think it's going to be Okuda, Okuwarie, and Hughes as your best three starting corners. Remember, Jerry Jacobs might be on the pup early on. Afedi Melifon was going to be a fourth corner for them, and he could even be in a rotation early on, depending on his development uh, out of Illinois. So yeah, that's kind of you know Bobby Price, Mark Gilbert as some more depth on that uh, in that cornerback room. So and then safety wise, to round it all out, we talked about I think their main rotation is going to be between Tracy Walker, Deshaun. Elliott, Elliott and Kirby Joseph. Will Harris might even get it. I don't know. They may let him go. It's going to be an interesting one to keep an eye out on there. JJ Hughes and some more depth uh, for this roster. So yeah, I like their secondary overall. They've got some good young talent in here and their defense in general is looking like uh, you know, it's going to be an interesting one, man. But Aaron Glenn, I'm super excited to see what he does into year number two. But that's the Detroit Lions. I think they did an unbelievable job and let's keep it going, Detroit. Going on to the Green Bay Packers where it was just a headache, man. Voice crack. But it it was like a mix of emotions. I was just driving. It was driving me crazy, man. Driving me crazy. Uh, Quay Walker, though, we'll start out with. And I like Quay Walker. I, was, I wasn't quite, like, super high on. Like, I wasn't a first round in that range. But I wasn't, like third, fourth round in that category with Quay Walker. Like, he's super talented. I thought he was in that 40 mix for me, somewhere 40, 50 range in the prospect rankings. Quay Walker's a good player. He's got a really nice, versatile skill set in Joe Barry's defense. Him and Devondre Campbell, yeah, it's a great one-two punch. But at the same time, I... I thought linebacker was an area that they could have gone after in the second, third round. I just felt like that was a better uh, use of their draft capital. And going after a receiver to me was way more important. And, and this was a team that I thought could get aggressive with Aaron Rodgers and the point where he's at. And you've seen A.J. Brown being traded. Why weren't the Green Bay Packers on the phone and saying, hey, we'll throw in a second rounder to beat Philadelphia's offer? Like, it just didn't make a whole ton of sense to me. They could have done it. I know their cap is a little bit tight, but... You know how it works. They can figure this stuff out. You know, it is it is what it is. I just didn't understand why they weren't in that sweepstakes. If they wanted to give up a second rounder to get Christian Watson, 
you could have given up your you know 22 in a second rounder or a third round pick and gotten AJ Brown in a trade and given you a viable number one right from the get-go but hey I, I respect Brian Kudukunz if he says you know what we want to build through the draft we're trying to do it that way so I get it that's I'm not going to completely knock him on that I just felt like there were other areas of need I would have even gone after Tyler Lindenbaum at 22 for me, it just would have been a better value, a better pick for them. And then you could have moved uh, Josh Myers over to guard and continued that offensive line build. And that would have allowed you to take one of those linebackers like Leo Chanel instead of, you know, even though I like Sean Ryan, but it would have opened you up to take a linebacker later in this draft. So I just felt like their strategy and their approach was a little bit off. And that's one of the reasons why I give this a B minus. And I think that was even great. Look, I, I don't think they had a bad draft because I think they got some really, really good picks too in this draft. Like they got some really, really good ones, but I also, there were some picks that I just really didn't love. So it's, it's kind of a, you know, a mix for me, a mixed bag. And that's kind of my view on it though, with Quay Walker and kind of the approach. And, and you look at these picks and with Devontae White. Now Devontae White, I like this pick a lot. He's going to come in there and compete right away with Dean Lowry. And you get yourself that dude that they've been looking for to pair along with Kenny Clark and take a little bit of pressure off of him and get another uh, dynamic piece into that defense line. I mean, he's got that first step explosiveness going to be able to get after the passer him and Kenny Clark are going to be a nice combination for the future and then you get Christian Watson who I do like and he's gonna be a great fit for this offense adding some speed that Marquez Valdez Scantling replacement him and uh you know Alan Lazard will be a nice combination on the outside and then I mean Sammy Watkins sure will work into that rotation as that backup outside receiver he can also mix into the slot there with um, Randall Cobb and uh, Mari Rogers but that's kind of your group of receivers um, it's better, but at the same time, I'm still a little worried about it, you know? I talk about this, but you have Aaron Rodgers. You have a defense that can win a championship. Yeah, it may not be a top five defense, but like your your defense at this point is going to need to be a top five defense, I think, if they're going to be a Super Bowl competitive team. They just needed to get that number two weapon that in the playoffs that teams cannot focus just on Devontae Adams. And that was my thing. Like you need to get another good weapon. So not everyone's just focusing on Devontae Adams. But now you don't have Devontae Adams. Hopefully Christian Watson can fill into that void and you can get someone else or something like that can step up Alan Lazard or whoever. But yeah, that's kind of, you know, Sammy Watkins needs to stay healthy for them too. Uh, but anyway, Sean Ryan, hopefully at least. And then Sean Ryan, I like that pickup out of UCLA. I like him a lot. I think he can come in there and be a nice quality guard. Remember, they draft a lot of tackles and move him to the inside. The same thing with Zach Tom. I love that pickup from Wake Forest, who has like two master's degrees already. And I mean, the kid is just crazy, man. Huh? Unbelievable for his age, what he's been able to do athletic or, uh, you know, off, um, what is the academically, he's been crazy. But getting those two offensive linemen, just awesome. And then you get Rasheed Walker too later in this draft. I know I'm going a little bit out of order, but Rasheed Walker's a guy to me, like, I just, he's so frustrating when I watch him at Penn State because he has all the tools to be a really good tackle at the next level. He's just nowhere near there. He's He lunges way too much. He, he overextends way too much as well, you know, which results in lunging. But he gives up that inside move way too much. He's oversets, overextends, you name it, right? His technique is all over the place. But in terms of like, he looks like an NFL tackle. He has the traits. He's got the athletic ability everything on paper he just needs to be coached that to me was a great move in the seventh round a steal now there are some medical things he may not he may have to redshirt this season so that's another reason why he ends up dropping but let's go back into order here let's go back to Romeo Dubs I think Romeo or we'll go to Romeo Dubs from Nevada he's going to be a guy that I think might even see the field a little bit here I think he could be in line for 100 200 snaps early on in his career and add another weapon on the outside he does have some nice uh, ability to uh, win vertically I, I think he's going to have to get stronger though uh, to to win more consistently. I think uh, as stronger NFL corners, he just didn't really uh, show enough at the senior bowl for me to win vertically what he did at the college level. Um, and then you get Kings League Nag Bari. This is an A-plus pick. I mean, in the fifth round. This is an awesome one, man. South Carolina edge rusher. Yeah, he doesn't maybe have the sack production. He doesn't have the elite get-off skills or the athleticism, but what he does have is violence. I mean, he's a dude that's going to come out there and give you that uh, reckless abandonment. And I compare him to like the Nico Autrys. He kind of gives me those by some versatility on the inside out he may be more of an inside player at the next level put on a little bit more weight and provide that five tech sort of role but I think he can be outside and inside versatility depending on the package I like that pick a ton in the fifth round uh, Tariq Carpenter Georgia Tech I think he's just gonna be a special teamer kind of a tweener safety linebacker prospect uh, yeah I think he's gonna be a good special teamer he's very good at Georgia Tech in special teams Jonathan Ford from Miami gonna be a rotational nose tackle behind Terrell Slayton and then finally Samari Toure I 
love this pickup too from Nebraska. A heck of a job in the East-West Shrine Bowl and what he was able to do. Had a nice touchdown there to kind of seal it out. And uh, yeah, Samari Toure, a nice little slot development piece behind Amadre Rogers. And you find some UDFA guys, uh, nothing too crazy there. But Ellis Brooks, I liked him at Penn State. I actually liked him more. And now he doesn't have the athletic traits that Brandon Smith has, but I actually liked him more on tape than Brandon Smith. Tyler Goodson as another running back. Same thing with B.J. Baylor. Uh, overall grade B minus. You look at the roster here. The offensive line, they're pretty deep now. Which, remember, you have a lot of injuries. Bakhtiari is coming back from that injury. Hopefully, he'll be ready to go. Ellen Jenkins may be on the pup list, too. So, Yash Newman, hopefully he's ready to go in his development, who showed signs of improving as the season went along. But Zach Tom could compete at the right tackle position. You get Rasheed Walker compete if he's healthy. Sean Ryan might compete over there at right tackle. You never do know. But you're going to have a lot of competition at that right tackle position. This is kind of how I see it early on and how they're going to roll with it. But, yeah, offense line, at least they have a lot of depth and a lot of competition for the future. So, I'm liking it. Uh, Receiver-wise, Again, I've heard, I've uh, expressed my opinion on it. I don't want to sound like a bull out of the china shop on this one, but I, I'm just worried they don't have enough weapons for Aaron Rodgers at this point. Um, anyway, that is what it is. The running back, they're fine. Aaron Rodgers, still, of course, is a beast. Uh, defensively, their defensive line is looking way, way better. I like Devontae Wyatt in this rotation now. Your defensive line looking pretty dang good there, which you're on Reed as well as kind of their rotation of four with Lowry, Clark, Wyatt, and Reed. Slayton can also work in there as a backup nose tackle. Uh, edge rushing wise, they're very. They seem to be very, very high on some of these guys like Randy Ramsey. So maybe he'll be a dude that can step up coming out from injury this past season. You still have Jonathan Garvin, but uh, yeah, that's kind of their group now with uh, Kingsley Nagbari, who will be a nice little third, fourth edge rusher with Randy Ramsey. And you've got your starters with Preston and Rashawn Gary. So yeah, defensive line those looking good. Just going to be a matter of who steps up as that depth. Is it Randy Ramsey or Kingsley Nagbari? Cornerback's another question, like their depth. Is it going to be Keyshawn Nixon or Shamir Jean Charles? Who's going to be that guy that steps up and, you know, is that fourth corner? And I think Jair Alexander, now I think it's going to be Jair Alexander, Eric Stokes, and base packages. Rajul Douglas could play in the slot, but if I had to guess, I think Jair might end up hopping in that star role on nickel packages. And then at corner, or at safety, should I say, uh, things, same thing. Vernon Scott might be their, you know, their third safety with Sean Davis too, but uh, Adrian Amos and Darnell Savage. Savage as their one-two punch is still really good. And then at linebacker, you've got Quay Walker and Devondre Campbell, which is really nice. I mean, I love it. I think it's going to be a really good one. Campbell has that, you know, coverage all around linebacker. Walker will continue to develop into that realm, but going to be good in terms of helping out this run game too. And then you have Chris Barnes and Ty Summers as that rotation. We'll see about Tariq Carpenter, but I think he's more of a special teamer. That's their roster though. That's kind of the, the uh, spots to keep an eye out on though, going into training camp. Big questions are going to be depth at the cornerback and the safety position. Overall, though, feeling pretty good about it. Um, that's going to be their roster, though. And, uh, yeah, anyway, Green Bay Packers, B- minus for me. I would have loved to see them get a little more aggressive at the receiver position. Maybe they will in free agency. Maybe Odell Beckham can, can come over here and I'll feel better about it or, you know, whoever, right? Uh, you know, whether it's Odell or whether it's Julio Jones. They just need to add one more piece. That's kind of my view on it. But Green Bay Packers, overall, Brian Gutekunst. I know I've been a little bit hard on them with the receiver position. I know everyone's like, take a receiver. But it is what it is. Overall. Overall, not too bad of a draft from the pack. On to the Minnesota Vikings as we wrap up the NFC North. And they had a really interesting draft, this new regime. Wow, it was crazy, man. They were all over the place trading up and down. First off, though, with the pick in the Detroit Lions, they traded with their division twice. And they traded with the Green Bay Packers there in the second round, which, hey, I don't, I, I don't have a problem with it personally. But that is just something you consider there. Did they get enough trade value? I still think they were winning. They're winning anyway. I'm winning. I can't lose. Uh, <laughs> uh, you could shoot me, but you can't kill me. Uh, Lewis Seen, though, here in the first round with their pick at 32 overall. I like Lewis Seen. He, I wasn't super high on Lewis Seen, but I do think it's a really good pick for them to combination with Cameron Bynum and Harrison uh, Smith. What a safety group that they have going forward. Just a great combination. Lewis Seen going to add some more like rough and tough, be that heat-seeking missile. Just an absolute monster there. And if he continues to work on his coverage ability and making plays in that back end, he definitely, you know, has the skill set to do it. Like the, the, the range, the speed, all of that. And it's, you know, he's got good uh, instincts too. It just, he's going to have to work on his actual ball skills and get better there. But, you know, definitely something to keep an eye out on. But either way, Lewis Seen in that back end, I don't mind it at all. Solid B plus for me. And then you, and after the draft capital, getting more draft capital, I always say this is a win. But you get Andrew Booth here in the second round, which is unbelievable. My favorite pick of this draft for the Minnesota Vikings and Skull Nation. 
what a value. I mean, I get it. Andrew Booth, he's very raw in terms of he hasn't played a whole ton of games, right? He only has one full season-ish of play, and he's had some injuries. Yes, that's going to be a concern, but... Look, when you watch Andrew Booth, first off, he looks like an NFL corner. Like, he has all the traits, the speed, the size. His footwork is unbelievable how smooth of a mover he is. He can play man. He can play zone. I think he can play either at a very high level. He's very scheme inverse or versatile, and you put him in here with Patrick Peterson, and it's not Patrick Peterson's job to teach him up or anything like that. You know, none of these players, It's you've got a coaching staff in place, but I do think Patrick Peterson is going to be able to help out Andrew Booth and be that mentor here in that secondary. So it's just going to be able to set the tone, right? Patrick Peterson will set the tone, set the work ethic, and help out Andrew Booth along with the coaching staff here. So I'm liking it. I think he could end up, when all said and being uh, done, could be one of the best corners in this draft. Then you get Ed Ingram here in the second round with the trade down from the Green Bay Packers. I think they had to move back up or they did some, you know, some maneuvering there. Anyway, with Ed Ingram, I thought it was a little bit early, but at the same time, a lot of the offensive guards were going off the board. Remember, Cole Strange went earlier than a lot of people thought. So it moved every guard up the position a little bit. So it was a reach for me. But at the same time, Adam Ingram's are really like super strong. I mean, that dude is just, he's looking to just brossel you to the ground. And that's what he does, man. His hand strength is unbelievably strong. He's going to have to continue to work overall in his, uh, he leans a little bit. You know, there's a little bit of a downside to that, right? He's a little heavy handed, but at the same time, you know, why he's going for those kill shots and aggressive as he is, he sometimes can lean a little bit because he's trying to die for you. So that's a bit of a problem. He's going to have to work on that, maybe calming down aggressiveness a little bit, you know? Hey, his, his, it's all good, man. It's all good. He's going to be a good one addition to add to their offensive line here in the second round. I could see him competing with Jesse Davis for that right guard position. And then you got Brian Osamoa. I mean, you have already got speed with Hicks and Kendrick, but you add in more speed with Brian Osamoa. I mean, look at all the chase and tacklers they have in this group. I mean, it's crazy, man. They may now they may struggle a little bit versus the run this year. Their front four or their front seven is gonna or front four, whatever, their defensive line, front five is gonna have to really be stout on the interior. We'll talk about that when we get into the roster breakdown to, to be less susceptible to the run because they do have a lot of lighter linebackers, more chase linebackers, dudes that might struggle a little bit more if, if it's not kept clear against the run but at the same time you're adding another element of speed with Brian Osamoa playing to the passing game remember this is a division with Aaron Rodgers in it so you have to make sure you can stop the pass and getting Brian Osamoa I like that there good solid value in the third round that's where I had him as a that third round I felt good about him there and it, you know overall very very solid um, and then you get a Caleb Evans in the fourth round here which was a great move a Tulsa transfer he, um, he, yeah, he, he went to Missouri. I just didn't find a picture of him at Missouri. But anyway, a Caleb Evans was a great value. I think he's a, one of those dudes who could actually push for a starting cornerback position earlier sooner than, rather than later, especially if you start dealing with injuries. A Caleb Evans is a dude I think will actually see some field time early on in his career. I like him a lot, and his press technique is really, really good. He was trained, or he, he was coached, really well coached. I forget the name who coached him there, but uh, it's blanking on me right now. But he was really well coached, and I think he's going to be able to, to provide some nice depth, got a good speed, size, six foot two, 200 pounds, uh, really, like I said, solid physical. He needs to work on his ball skills, doesn't have a whole ton to his acclimate there at Tulsa or Missouri, but you're getting a guy who comes in there and going to provide some more help in that cornerback room, which is really rebuilding their secondary. And then going on to their defensive line now with Asazi Otomewo. I like this guy a ton. Remember, if you're looking for this uh, you know, Rams sort of defense coming over here with Mike McDaniel and what they're going to be trying to be doing here, maybe on the defense side of the ball with Asazi Otomewo, who could be playing that Sebastian Joseph Day sort of position, I think he's going to be that five-tech tweener. And he's going to be a developmental project. He has all the tools you look for. Nice athleticism, good, strong, uh, powerful arms, and good length and everything like that. He just needs to be taught. He needs to be learned, learn how to pass rush, right? He needs to learn how to get after the quarterback. That's going to be his big thing. But I like the swing here in the fifth round to get Asazi Otomewo on that defensive line. Then you get Ty Chandler as another rotational running back, um, which is fine, beyond Keanu Nwongo, who will probably be their third running back with uh, Alexander Madison, of course, Dalvin Cook. But adding a little bit more speed, good contact balance with Ty Chandler. Staying up is, is one of his things, man. He's smaller, but he stays.
plays on his feet. You get veteran Lowe here from Illinois, and he's a really smart offensive lineman. I don't know if he's got tons of upside, but I think he'd be a good solid swing tackle. And remember, their tackle depth is a little bit thin. You know, break Brendel. I know Oli Oda is going to be moving back over to tackle, I believe, at least early reports of that. So he can be another swing tackle for you. Jalen Naylor from Michigan State, going to be more of a gadget weapon early on in his career as he continues to develop. He's he struggled at the catch point quite a bit there at Michigan State. And, you know, his size, a little bit on the smaller side. So those are things. But great kick returner. I think he's going to be someone who competes early on on the special team side of the, th- of the ball. And, uh, yeah, that's kind of what you're looking at here in the sixth round, getting another special team talent. And then Nick Muse is a developmental dude from South Carolina. Definitely has some athletic ability to him. Um, so we'll see how he ends up working out. But I think he can also develop into his blocking skills. See him as a nice little Johnny Munt sort of uh, dude, you know, as a kind of a third, fourth, or third, second, the second, third, fourth tight end behind Irv Smith. But yeah, some UDFA guys there. Overall grade for me was a B. They got some more draft capital, taking more swings at it. Maybe I'm not super high on maybe all of these guys. But at the same time, I think that they got some really good pieces and some foundation pieces for them in the future. So going into the roster now, we take a look at some comp- Competition battles, which will be underway sooner rather than later. But anyway, right guard position. That's the big one that stands out to me. Who ends up winning that job? I'm giving the edge to Jesse Davis, the veteran coming in here. I, I, it will be close, though. Ed Ingram, second-round pick, man. I think he's going to be fine and pushing for that job early on. And Jesse Davis also has ability to swing over there and be a nice swing tackle for them because that's something that they they may want to look at, too. Because between Brake Brendel and Ole Uda, who ends up winning as a swing tackle? I mean, it just depends there. You have veteran low, too, they bring in. But, yeah, I, I definitely think Jesse Davis might end up being their swing tackle. At least that's going to be their hope. And Ed Ingram wins that job. And then the rest of this offensive line, I think you have three solidified sort with Ezra Cleveland, Christian Derisaw, and Brian O'Neill. Bradbury, I think also probably going to be a solidified starter for them. They didn't really bring in any more competition, so hopefully Garrett Bradbury can continue his development into year number four. I mean, you do have Austin Schlotman. He also can provide some guard versatility there, but yeah, that's kind of their, their group. I think Garrett Bradbury ends up winning that job, and you have those four guys as your starters, and then your right guard position ends up being a competition there. Um, now, receiver-wise, uh, Thielen and Jefferson locked in as your starters. The big thing will be the additions, or I mean the um, overall development of KJ Osborne and Amir Smith-Marset. You still have BC Johnson. So yeah, Dan Chesna as well. So that's kind of their, their grouping. You had in Jalen Naylor. I think he's more of a gadget player though and a special teamer. But yeah, not too bad. The receiving room looking pretty good. Tight end room looking uh, solid. I mean, Johnny Munt is a good solid backup, man. And he knows the scheme. You have Ben Ellison who will be competing there too with, with Munt as well as Zach Davison and even Tanner Muse when he gets out there. But running back-wise, obviously Dalvin's your starter with Alex Madison as that clear backup. Gina Nwongu and Ty Chandler will be some nice rotation and special teams. And then quarterback-wise, who will be the backup? It's going to be between Sean Mannion and Kellen Mond. Does Mond end up winning that job this year? Something to keep a close eye out on to Nate Stanley to round it all out there. But Kirk Cousins, let's go, Kirk Cousins. You like that? On to the defense, which I'm liking it. I'm liking the improvements here. And what I will say, let's start out with the cornerback position because I want to say this. First off, who ends up playing this slot? Andrew Booth could play in this slot early on in his career. I, I like him on the outside, but he definitely has the ferociousness. And the dude is, you know, yes, he can work on his tackling technique, but he is aggressive and he is explosive at making tackles. And I love the playmaking ability of him. And maybe he ends up being the slot. Who knows? Channing Sullivan definitely going to be looking at a long-term upgrade there. You have some competition between Perry Nickerson and Nate Harrison for the time being. But yeah, I mean, Booth could play over there. Dan and Peterson, that's probably their best group of three corners is Booth, Dantzler, and Peterson. So if they want to get all three of those guys out on the same time in nickel packages, Booth could end up playing in the slot. Uh, Caleb Evans could definitely push for a role for injuries and stuff like that. You still have Harrison Hand and Chris Boyd as some more depth. So feeling good, though, overall about their cornerback room. They're going to find a good, solid rotation. I feel good about that. And then safety, same thing between Bynum, Scene, and Smith. They're looking pretty good, man. That's a pretty good grouping. And then linebacker. Backer-wise, same thing. They're pretty deep, man. They've got a lot of young talent here between Osamoa, Surratt, uh, Blake Lynch. So, yeah, uh, not too bad. Uh, Travis Dye as well to round it all out. Brian Osamoa going to probably be that number three guy with, uh, of course, um, adding in um, Eric Kendrick still here and then Jordan Hicks adding in him in, in free agency. And then the defensive line-wise, you mainly just add in Asazi Otomewo. You got some UDFAs out there, but Daniil Hunter and Zadaria Smith, man, what a combination. DJ Woonham, Patrick Jones, Janarius Robinson, 
as kind of your rotation of three, four guys. On the interior defensive line, you had Harrison Phillips, Dalvin Tomlinson. Both guys can play on the nose, so I can imagine. Even even Armin Watts can play at the nose. So they got a lot of versatility, but I, you know, I don't know. Maybe Jalen Twyman ends up playing a lot of reps in that second year for him. See how his development goes along. James Lynch on that defensive line. A Sezi Otomewo could even carve out a little bit of a role. You got Ty McGill as another backup there on that nose tackle position. But yeah, that's a, that's a pretty, you know, you got some good competition on that defense of line maybe not the most you know crazy getting after the passer you're going to look for a little more pass rush there but they've got some guys to be at least hold up in the run game help out those you linebackers with the speed make sure you know because again they've got a lot of speed out there at linebacker overall excited for the minnesota vikings i think they've got a pretty good roster and they will definitely be competing they might be the best team in that division they're definitely possible we'll see how it all goes detroit lions are going to be way way better i think so but this division's getting a little bit tougher, at least, with this with new additions. Anyway, that's going to be it here for the AFC North. Let me know who are your winners, who are your losers. I think the Detroit Lions were the clear winners for me. And after that, everyone kind of had a decent draft. I wouldn't say they were excellent. But overall, not too bad for any of these guys, adding some more talent into their rosters. But yeah, that's going to be it here. My name is G-Sling. I'm doing my thing. And I hope you have a great day. I'll talk to you.